Hello and welcome back to day two midday keynote. Look at what Ruth is Ruth smile over there. I am <laughs> thrilled about that. Um, I'm looking forward to your presentation here, your keynote. Uh, for for those who don't know Ruth, uh, she's an open source evangelist who's been around for for almost two decades, uh, having experience with so many different open source projects. Actually, different projects as well. Um, I think a lot of people who come from the Joomla uh, community probably know her as the former community leadership uh, team member there. And uh, she also built a full uh, service digital agency. And now as an employee of Acquia, she's the project lead for Mautic. Um, I think some people think they know Ruth, but let me let me tell you some things. Uh, I think some <laughs> uh -oh. are <laughs> runner, very keen runner at that, uh, east of England, uh, east side of England, a uh, lover of cats, uh, she's been called a genius by her mother. Really? <laughs> when she was when she was younger, uh, she, her girl guides leader said, uh, "This is a quote here: Ruth is kind, trustworthy, uh, loves animals, frequently works well with others. Uh, she likes to help old ladies cross the street, whether they want to or not." And um, uh, yeah, and the other thing I know about her is her heart is in the right place because I I heard that from her cardiologist. So. Um, let me let me today introduce Ruth. Go ahead and uh, take here. Thanks for being here, Ruth. Thank you, David. Gosh, how can I top that? I mean, you should be the main man, really. <laughs> okay. Let's get the slides up and let's get this show on the road. Yeah, so thank you, everyone, for joining this keynote. It's great to be back again. Um, as David mentioned, so my name's Ruth Cheesley. My pronouns are she, her. I live in Ipswich, so you can see some photos there of our lovely waterfront town in the east of England, and I work as project lead for Mautic. You can connect with me online pretty much anywhere with Arch Easley. And after this presentation, I'll also share the slides and resources on my notice page, so you won't have to kind of take notes and stuff. They'll all be there. It doesn't seem like it, but it was only sort of six, seven months ago that we were putting on our first ever World Conference. So this was the first time we'd ever really brought the community together in big numbers. We were planning to have it in Boston. Unfortunately, the pandemic had other ideas. We had to quickly pivot to a digital event. And so Morticon 2020, our first event, happened online. It was so successful. We had such great feedback that we decided why not do it again? And actually, I think this event has been even better, even if, if that was possible. The tech has been a bit better, a bit more improved. We've learned a lot from the first experience. We've had lots more people joining us who didn't attend last time. So it's been really great to see this event continue to grow. And what I'm pleased to say is that the team have decided that our World Conference, so this event, will always happen virtually. We feel like it is an opportunity to bring everyone together in our community without the worry of visas, of travel, of accommodation. And it allows a lot more uh, flexibility for our speakers as well. So even if the pandemic goes away, we'll still stay virtual. Definitely deserving of my favorite emoji, the dancing banana. We are making tentative plans, very tentative plans, for an in-person conference in November. But that does, of course, all revolve around what happens with the COVID rules. So do keep an ear out because we will be telling you if we're actually going to go ahead with this or not. I really hope that actually worldwide we are able to get this pandemic under control. We've lost so many friends, family members. Lots of people around the world have really suffered. But it's great to see that things are starting to edge towards getting this pandemic under control. And I can't wait to sit down in a bar with a glass of lemonade and just hang out with people. It's just not the same on Zoom, no matter how much we try. And I was thinking the other day, oh, I feel like we're not making enough progress. We're not doing enough. I quite often say to myself, I'm not doing enough. But actually, if we think back, it was only two years, just over two years ago that this announcement came pretty much out of the blue to everyone in the community that Acquia was acquiring Mautic Inc. and with it, the brand of Mautic and the community. I can remember reading this article 
and having real mixed feelings. And at the time in the community, there was lots of fear, there was lots of uncertainty. We didn't know whether the project was going to continue or not. And I'm really pleased to see how strongly we've come out of that fear, uncertainty and doubt. We really have made huge progress over the last two years. And MOTIC is really starting to grow and thrive and attract people to the community, to the product, and to the organizations who are building up an ecosystem around us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's happened in the community over the last year. Some of you who are maybe new to Mortic, or maybe you're a, a user of Mortic, but you don't really get involved in the community, may not actually know what happens under the hood in order for this project to make the releases and give you the updates. So in the last 12 months, we had 172 individual contributors across GitHub, so making features or bug fixes in pull requests, which we call PRs in Slack, so responding to someone who then says thank you, which is an indication that you've been helpful to someone. In the forums where your responses have been marked as a, a solution, and also in Stack Overflow and Reddit. So those are the areas that we monitor the community at the moment. And all the names you can see in the Mortibot here are those 172 contributors. And the size of the name is based on the number of contributions that that individual has made. So you may see your name there. You may not see your name there. You may not be so happy with how small your name is there. So that's my challenge to you next year is let's see your name on there if it's not there now. Let's see it bigger if it's there as well. And last year, just for um, comparison, we had 113 contributions. So that's a 52% increase in the last year. That's pretty good going, really, to see that increase in contributors. But it's not only about individuals. We also want to have, as a more sustainable model for open source, organizations getting involved, contributing, encouraging their team to get involved and contribute. So in the last 12 months, we had 19 organizations contribute to Mortic across all the same channels that I mentioned before. Little Mortibot feels a bit empty to me. Doesn't he feel a bit empty to you? But still, these organizations are the ones who've been contributing to Mortic. And again, the larger names are the ones that are contributing more. Smaller names are the ones that are contributing less. So next year, I would love to see our little Mortibot bursting out the seams because there's so many more organizations who are making contributions to the project. But last year, we had 13. And now we have 19. So that's a 46% increase. So I'm actually really pleased. We're moving in the right direction. We're having more organizations seeing the value in contributing back to Mortic and making a difference to the project. And when we look at those contributions, you can see that in 2019, it was really pretty stagnant. It was a little bump here and there, but it was pretty low. And you can see the big epic bumps as we go up to Mortic 3. There was a huge amount of work involved in that release massive number of contributions from lots of people. And then we had a bit of a lull. I think this is the bit where everyone goes, oh my goodness, I'm exhausted. That was hard work. But it takes a breather. And then we start to ramp up again as we're coming towards Mortic 4. But the thing that I'm really pleased about is that we are still maintaining that high level of contribution, the highest that we've seen since the acquisition. So things are still growing. We are still seeing people coming into the project who are new. We're seeing people contributing more. And that is great from my perspective. But we definitely would not be in this position if it weren't for this bunch of awesome people. So these are the leadership team of the Mortic community. They each stepped up to help us in various areas of the community. You may well have heard about the different teams that they lead and what they do in Mortic. So I'm not going to go into great detail about that here. But I will draw your attention to the fact we have two positions vacant at the moment, assistant team lead for education and for marketing. So if you think you might like to help us with improving our documentation, our forums, making good quality resources available to Mautic users, assistant team lead for education would be a great opportunity. Likewise, if you're a marketer or you're interested in helping us market Mautic better to the outside world, as well as communicate within the community, the assistant team lead for the marketing team would be a great opportunity. 
So if you're interested in those, do reach out to the team leads. Feel free to ping me if you have any questions. But I do encourage you to just step up and say, yeah, I'll try. Just give it a go. Even if you think you haven't got all the skills you need, start somewhere and learn and we'll help you to learn. So let's have a little book, look at what's actually been happening in the community. We've seen a really substantial growth in meetup members and attendees. And this is all amidst the pandemic. It's been really great to see people really engaging with the meetups that we have got running at the moment. We've got official Maltic meetups located in all these places. I'm really excited and so are the Spanish community about the Valencia group, which has just started up. We also have started integrating remote meetups. So we've got the Maltic help desk meetup, which is a great opportunity. It's led by David and Joey, and you can bring questions or problems that you have with Maltic and it's facilitated by them, but the whole of the group help each other with those issues. There's also the German language Maltic Monday, which happens, I think, once a month, led by Eki Grembel. So we're kind of investigating how we move forwards in this pandemic world. But if you see that list and think, why is my place not on that list? If you want to start a meetup, we really would encourage that. These are the things you need to do to do that. You need to have enough people to be interested in actually coming to a meetup. So a thread in the forums is a great place to do that, to say, I want to start a meetup in this location. Who wants to join me? It can be remote at the moment. It doesn't have to be in person. We do encourage you to have more than one person. We need a location for it to be based in. Ideally, think about where you might meet so that when we can go back to meeting in person, you have an idea of where. But a regular date is the thing that really helps. The meetups that have been successful are the ones that meet, say, the first Tuesday of every month at six o'clock. And people know and it's in their calendar. And we can also help you with finding your first few speakers. So I'd really love to see us capitalize on this and really drive the local meetups in our community. There's nothing better than being able to hang out with other Mortic users, ask that really annoying question that you've been trying to solve for weeks. That's why I first started a user group, and that's how I got involved in open source. Was I had problems and I had no one to ask. And someone helped me fix a problem within like 10 minutes that I'd spent like the whole day trying to fix. So I saw the value of having other people that I could connect with locally. And the Community Partners Program is also something we've launched this year. It's been a huge success so far. We have five founding partners that you can see here. If you want to find out more about them and read more about their case studies or maybe even work with them, have a look at mau.tc slash partners. That will take you to the partners page on the website or it's on the top menu. These are people who are contributing actively to Mortic. They're helping us to grow and thrive and they're financially contributing as well. And I'm really pleased that at the end of this month, Drop Solid are going to be joining this awesome team of companies. So how do you become a partner? First off, you need to be financially supporting us. You can do that on GitHub sponsors, or you can do that on opencollective.com slash Mortic if you prefer. You can find more information about this on the website, on the blog post where we announced the partners program. But it's not only about money. We only really want partners if they're contributing to make Mortic more successful. So you also have to be contributing in any of the ways that I talked about earlier, or running a team, or leading an initiative, or something like that. We need to show sustained financial and practical contributions over three months, and then we will consider in the council whether that organization can be selected as a partner. And you might be saying, well, how much do I have to sponsor to be eligible? We've tried to find a way to make this as equal as possible around the world. If we were to just say everyone had to sponsor at $100 in the US or the Europe or other regions, that's much more achievable than in some places in the world. So that's not really a fair system. So what we've done is we've taken a metric. It's not perfect. There are some places where it falls down called the Big Mac Index. Google it if you want to know more. There's more information also on the um, page, the blog post where we announced this. But this graph shows you the sponsorship amount in dollars that you would have to be contributing on a monthly basis based on the country of your head office. So it basically takes the cost of a Big Mac and uses that as the relationship to the US dollars cost of a Big Mac. 
so you can work out the cost. So if you're somewhere like Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, you'd be paying slightly more than the $100 in the US. But if you're in somewhere like Ukraine or Russia, you'd be paying significantly less. And these are minimums. So you can decide to pay more if you want to. These are just the minimums that we require. And there is a discrepancy there with Lebanon because of the hyperinflation in that country. If there's anyone from Lebanon who wants to become a partner, come speak to me and we'll figure out what the appropriate rate is. If your country isn't on here as well, come and chat to us and we can figure out what that rate would be. But this is the best way that we could think of to make it a fair way for anyone, wherever you are in the world, to become a partner. So that's a couple of things that have happened over the last year. And I couldn't believe it that we missed this. We missed an opportunity for cake and candles, folks. How could we have done this? Because it was only a year ago that we launched Mortic 3, a year and two days. It was on the 15th of June. Can't believe I forgot that. But it was the biggest thing we've done since Mortic was created, the biggest release that had been made. It was a really big deal. There was so much work that went on to get this release over the line. We had 20 people who contributed. We had nearly 4,000 files that were changed as a result of this, in this uh, project. And at that time, well, slightly before, we also decided we were going to move to a monthly release cycle. So this means that we would be making a release every single month. We start with Mortic 3, and then we would have two bug fix releases. Then we would have 3.1, which includes features, and then two bug fixes, and then Mortic 3.2, which includes features. And you get the picture. So we introduced this because there'd been a bit of a stagnation in releases. We weren't really making progress with the big backlog we had. Those of you who like numbers, this is what it looked like. So 12, 13, 15 in 2015, 16, 17, and then it really tanked in 2018 and 19. We're now back on track. We're doing really well. But that's why we that's where we were at, basically. So far, we've actually managed to hit all of those releases. We've managed to get all of them and then some because we had a security issue that necessitated making another uh, release and we had a couple of hot fixes as well. The only one that we didn't hit the timeline on is the Mortic 4 release. We were being a little bit ambitious in trying to get that done by the end of May. Unfortunately, we still have a few changes and a few bugs that we need to test and fix before we can make the release. And because most of the team who were involved in the Mortic 4 project are also involved in this event, it wasn't something we could do at the same time. So we're giving ourselves a couple of weeks to get through those last bugs. You can help us by testing the beta in a local environment or a development environment, which you can download from GitHub, or you can test the features branch, which is the latest code. We do have a lot of people who are still on Mortic 2. So this chart shows you all the versions. I should also say that this is only people who are calling home to see if there's an update to the Mortic update server. So it may not include SaaS providers who use their own update server. But you can see here, we've got a lot of instances that are still on the Mortic 2 series. But the Mortic 3 ones, we're generally tending to get people staying up to date. So that's really good progress. When we looked at this last year, there was a lot more down in the lower ends of the twos. So we are getting there. But we do have a lot of 2.16 releases that still need to be migrated to 3. So what's coming up in Mortic 4? I expect that's something that you're quite interested in and in knowing what's actually coming in this next feature release. Major release, I should say, sorry. So these stats are accurate as at yesterday evening. You can see immediately there's significantly less files that have been changed, less commits. We've got more contributors, which is great. 16 contributors, extra contributors compared to last year's Mortic 3. But we're actually roughly the same timeline. Alan made the first pull request with what we think we need to do to change to support Symphony 4 back on the 15th of November. That's when we first started working on this project, and we're looking at releasing at the end of July. So we're not far off about the same timeline that we looked at for the Mortic 3 release as well. So what I'm going to do is take you through some of the features. Some of them you may have seen or heard about. Some of them you may not have done. And there'll be some videos, some of the ones that I've recorded, some of the ones that the initiative leads have recorded. So let's have a look. Let's jump in. 
We've got the tag management user interface. So this is something that was supplied by Leuchtfeuer Digital Marketing. And also some tests were written by other organizations in the community. So thanks to those for providing this, but also helping us get this into a state where we could merge. And here's a short video. So that's a great improvement, I think you'll agree, from what we had before. It's definitely um, a good start. It's something that we can work on and iterate on. And what I would suggest we talk about now is the email builder. So I think the email builder is probably the one that most people um, will have heard about at some point. If you haven't tested it out yet, that's fine. I'm going to show you a little video of that as well. So the email builder is based on an open source framework called Grapes.js. So you'll often hear people refer to it as the Grapes.js builder, and that's what the icon looks like in the plugins. It was originally contributed by Web Mechanic, so thank you so much for all the work you did to actually get this started. And then Adrian Shimp from Idea2 has taken that on and has been doing lots of refactoring and optimizing and improving and fixing of bugs. We've also had three themes from Joey at Friendly, and we've had two teams, uh, two other themes from Hartmut IO. So really appreciate all those organizations who've contributed um, to this initiative. So here's a little video for this one. Again, pretty cool. I mean, it doesn't bear any resemblance, does it, to what we have in the builder at the moment. It's great to see a modern user interface. I would also say that the skin that you see there is the dark skin. We're actually going to have a Mortic theme skin that will be white with the purple accents when we actually make the release. This was just done in a development environment that didn't have that theme applied. So the next thing is the Mort Mortic marketplace, which I have to say quite slowly sometimes. This is available in a beta release, and it allows you to read only. So you can't actually install anything yet. The main reason for that is the underlying stuff that is needed to do that was required before we could actually build it. And that's in the Composer initiative, which we've only just finished. So this allows you to see all of the packages that are available, bundles that you could install, or plugins that you could install for Mortic. And it allows you to go through and view information about the releases, about the maintainers, and so forth. So I'm super excited to actually have this start to be uh, coming into production so we can use this in Mortic. I'll talk a little bit about that later when we get to the initiatives. 
And the next one is one for you DevOps folks or developers who are fans of using Composer to manage Mortic. The Composer initiative was a huge undertaking. There's been an epic amount of work that's been done, mostly by Nick from Drop Solid, but also really appreciate the help from Rahul Shinde from Accelerant, who has also been helping with reviewing PRs, giving feedback and suggestions, and helping with this project generally. So if you like Composer, pay attention, because you're going to be very excited by this next video. Okay, pretty cool. So the next thing is also maybe going to be of interest to developers, but it also should be of interest to the users of Mortic. In the process of working on over the last year on our releases, we've also been working on improving our automated test coverage. And what this means is every piece of code in Mortic, we want to get to the point where as much as possible, there are tests that actually make sure that piece of code does what it's supposed to do. And if it stops doing what it's supposed to do, or throws an error, or something isn't as it's expected, it should tell our developers there's a problem with this test and it's failing so they can see what their changes has broken somewhere else in Mortic. One of the main reasons why we experience bugs is because when we started monitoring this, we were only at around 20%, 28%, I think it was, of the code that powers Mortic actually having tests. So that's a huge percentage where we could have changed something and we wouldn't know that something had broken. When we released Mortic 3, we mandated that all pull requests that we merge, so bug fixes or features, must have automated tests that either improve or maintain the level of coverage. So a couple of bumps here I just want to clarify because people are going to ask this question. So this is this went down here because we actually started by just looking at the app folder and then we added plugins. So we added a whole load more code. So the percentage went down. And we have a blip that goes up here because with the Composer project, we were going to remove a bunch of directories. Then we realized that was a really bad experience for developers, so we put them back in again. So that's why it kind of went up and went down again. But you can see here the 3.1 release, yeah, little bit of a change. 3.2, little bit of a change, not massive. When we start getting to 3.3 and then working towards 4, we can see substantial increases in test coverage. So I just want to say a really huge thank you to all of the developers who have politely replied with, of course, Ruth, when I said, please, can you add tests? Or this these tests are failing, can you correct them? Or we can't merge this until we need until we have test coverage up. Because that is what's making Mortic more stable. That's what will bring us a more stable Mortic. If you're a developer and you like writing automated tests, I'm told people like that do exist. Please do think about helping us with that. Go on to GitHub, look at pull requests, and then filter the pull requests by those that are needing automated tests. You can use the label to find them. That would be a super, super valuable thing that you could do with your time, and it would help us get a lot of things merged that are currently blocked. So some important notes to just mention about the Mortic 4 release. Firstly, you must update to Mortic 3 before you can update to Mortic 4. So all of those instances who are two on, still on 2.16 or, or less, you will need to update to Mortic 3 before you can get the Mortic 4 update. So please think about doing that. 
at your earliest convenience. Another important one is we're removing OAuth 1 in 4.0. So this is a particular type of technology that lets you connect to other tools using APIs generally. This has been deprecated since 2012, so I'm so glad we're actually getting rid of it finally. We have got OAuth 2 support, so you'll need to just switch over to OAuth 2 support. Most integrations should support that now. We've also got client credentials if you need to still use that. That was brought in with Mautic 4. It's an alternative that you could use for OAuth 1. You will also need to make a one-line change in any themes that are not the themes that ship with Core. The reason for this is that we now allow email, um, we now allow themes to specify in the configuration file what builders they support. And notice I say builders with an S. So you're able to say this, this theme can be used in the legacy builder and in the GreatJS builder and in my bespoke builder. We need you to change that line, one line in your configuration file um, for any themes that are not core themes. And that's documented on the docs page for the new builder. PHP 8 support we were hoping to bring in, but we haven't actually been able to do that. We've done a lot of work to actually increase all of our dependencies to get ready for this. But there are still some dependencies that we need to make changes before we can actually support PHP 8. We're looking at probably 4.1 in September, possibly. If you'd like to help us with this, please do drop us a line in the um, Mautic 4 or in the product team Slack channel. And also, I want to just make it clear that Mautic 3.3.3, which is the current release of Mautic, will continue to get security updates for six months after Mautic 4 is released. But it will not get any more bug fixes unless they're security fixes or features. So you need to be updating to Mautic 4 if you want to get bug fixes and features. For developers, have a look on our GitHub repository. You'll find the upgrade for MD file in the root of our GitHub repository. That will tell you all of the backwards compatibility breaking changes that we're introducing with the 4.0 release that you need to take into account for your code, for your plugins, or whatever you're doing with Mautic. And there's a short link there, mau.tc slash m4bc breaks with hyphens in the middle. So that's some notes about Mautic 4. Let's just have an update on initiatives. So if you weren't in the keynote uh, last November, an initiative is a time boxed, often a complex project. It's usually going to take about six to 12 months in duration. Sometimes they may be more. They may span over more than one year. Usually it involves multiple stakeholders across the project. And whilst they are generally about the product, they could also be an initiative which is about the community. So in November, I outlined six strategic initiatives where we were going to focus on these big projects that we felt we needed to do in the community. The first one was composer support. And that one has been completed, as I mentioned. That is the phase one of the composer project. There is more work that we want to do, that we need to do. So if you're interested in helping with that, do join the Composer Support Initiative channel. Um, we do have a lot of expertise in there, but we're always interested to hear from people who have expertise in Composer. The email and landing page builder. Also, this is pretty much done. We, as I mentioned, we've still got a few things we need to work through before the 4.0 release. Again, I mentioned Web Mechanic and Idea2 are the two main contributors to this project. There is also going to be a phase two to this. It's never complete, is it? So there are also other things that we want to do that are not going to be done for the 4.0 release, but that we want to make sure that we do get to. Things like making sure that the JavaScript that powers the builder has got automated tests, and also maybe adding more configurable blocks within the builder. So if you'd like to get involved with that, do join the builders channel and find out more about how you can, how you can help with that initiative. The marketplace, as I mentioned, is in beta. We desperately need help on the marketplace project. John's done an amazing job in getting it to the point where it is now, but he's doing all that work in his spare time. So if you'd like to help, we could really do with some developers to help us with actually building out the infrastructure that we need to make this all work now that we've got the Composer initiative up and running. 
We also need input from user experience people to help tell us how we can do this in a way that is easy for marketers to use in the way that they expect to interact with this kind of um, to tooling and technology and from users of Mortic. So head over to the Mortic Marketplace Initiative chat if you'd like to get involved with this one. The resource management one, we haven't had an awful lot of interest in this initiative. However, the implementing a Mortic wide foldering system, we have got a new contributor who is interested in working on this. And this is an agency called Deeper. They've actually had a couple of calls with us and the product team, and they've supplied some wireframes for how they think this initiative might work, the implementing a foldering system. We're at the stage now where we need feedback from users of Mortic, from developers, from user experience folk. So please do look in the resource management initiative channel, have a look at the video recording of the previous call so you can get a sense of how this would work and do give us your feedback. I'm hoping that we'll be able to get this into one of the feature releases in the four series. So maybe September or maybe the end of the year, depending on how quickly we can move with providing feedback to the people who want to build this. And this one we've not actually had anyone interested in working on, which is a bit of a shame because installing and upgrading is probably the number one challenge that people face with Mortic in the community, particularly in the forums. What we want to do here is add some pre-flight checks to the Mortic install process and upgrade process. We already do this in the Mortic 3 migration script, which stops you from proceeding if there's problems that are likely to cause your upgrade or install to fail. We don't have those checks currently in the process for installing and upgrading. So we'd like to actually introduce them. But we also need to do some improvements with the user interface, like in the install process, but also once you've installed, helping people understand how to get started with Mortic. And we need to improve the documentation. How do I install Mortic on Ubuntu? How do I install Mortic with Docker? How do I install Mortic with Kubernetes? How can I manage Mortic with Ansible? All those things would be great to have articles in our knowledge base. So that also falls into this initiative and we would really love to have some help. There's a bountied issue there if you want to help us with implementing those checks into the install and upgrade process. It's all really clearly detailed in that GitHub issue. So if you want to work on that, let us know. and We can give you some guidance and get you started. And then finally, next generation initiative. So this is one that you've probably heard a little bit about. Once we release Mortic 4, that's when we said we're going to start seriously thinking about how we're going to deliver the next generation of Mortic. We know that we need to make some significant changes in the architecture of Mortic. The way it was built was not built to scale to very high uh, levels of use, and we're seeing very high levels of use in organizations around the world. So we need to make some fundamental changes to how Mortic works, and that's what we're planning to do with the Next Gen initiative. So my vision for Mortic of the future is that it will be the ultimate fully featured and scalable marketing automation layer, which can stand alone or can be dropped into any existing marketing stack that you have. So that would enable organizations to seamlessly deliver an integrated experience, which delights the marketers who are using the software as much as it delights the customers who are receiving the um, output from the software. It's going to take us a while to get there. There are some key issues we need to work on with this. Last November, I shared a rough timeline of what we were thinking in terms of future releases. I want to add a caveat here. This is not a mark this date in the diary. Ruth said that this release was coming on that date. It's not one of those. This is a rough idea of how we think things are going to go so that you can have a sense for when we think we'll be making progress. So this is where we're at the moment. We've done the Mortic 3 releases, we've built Mortic 4. And the reason why we've been doing that is because Symphony 3, that Mortic 3 is based on, comes to the end of its life at the end of 2021 in November. So we need to have Mortic 4 out by then because the version of the framework that we're based on is no longer supported. But that version that we're upgrading to is also going to come to the end of its life. So Symphony 4 will become 
end of life at the end of 2023. That may seem like a really long way away from you. But if you think about all of the work that went on in the three and the four releases, it's actually not an awful lot of time for us to make sure that we are now on Symphony 5 by that point. So whilst we're doing our Mortic 4 releases, we're going to have to work on a Mortic 5 release. We're just not going to be able to get a next generation initiative up and running and out of the door in time to meet the end of life of Symphony 4. It's just not feasible with the resources that we have currently. So what I envisage we end up doing is actually having Mortic 5 release and then maybe even six plus after that. For me, it's important that the people who are using Mortic have stability, that you know that there is a version of Mortic that's coming that's going to support you going forwards. But alongside that, we also need to do this big project to actually address the fundamental cracks in our houses, in the foundations, and not just keep papering over them. So that's going to start in earnest at the end of this year, beginning of next year. We're going to start doing proof of concepts. We're going to start looking at how can we do this and is it going to give us what we need going forwards? You can get involved with this. We're going to be working on project briefs, outlining specific tasks. It may well be that companies take on specific chunks of this. So they work on a particular part of the next gen initiative. It may be individual contributors work on very specific tasks. We're exploring all kinds of way, ways to make this happen. And then what we're aiming for is towards the end of 2024, beginning of 2025, that we'll have a next generation version of Mortic. It may not have feature parity with what we have in release at Mortic at that time. It may be that we decide to have an MVP, so a minimum viable product, with a specific set of bundles that are considered to be the absolute necessary ones, and that we then iterate on that and work on releasing other ones going forwards. But that's a very, very rough and a very non-committal timeline from me to you to give you a sense of what we're looking at. By that time, I want us to have grown the community as well in the same kind of way that we're growing the community now so that we will have more contributors, more organizations and more resources to do this work. So do hop into the Next Generation channel if you want to know more about this. You can watch back the calls that we've had about this and the decisions that we've made in the channel and on Confluence. All of that information is available to you and we'd love to have your involvement. So now the last part of this presentation is what we learned and what are we going to change in the coming years? So we've definitely learned something from having a monthly release process. It's worked really well. Having that release every month has meant we've had to keep on top of our features and bug fixes. It's meant that we've had to keep the momentum going. It means that we're getting code out to you consistently. Needing people to add tests has slowed us down. It's meant there's features that we have not been able to merge or bug fixes we've not been able to push. However, it is helping us build a more stable Mortic. I'm willing to take that trade off if we get more stability as a result. We really do need more developers and more users of Mortic to help us test. It's a very, very small but awesome and amazingly dedicated team who are doing a lot of this work. It would help us immensely if people would consider giving a couple of hours a week where your team can contribute to Mortic. We would be able to go so much faster if we had those resources. So please have those conversations with your boss or if you are the boss, make that decision. It would really help us. We also need to plan who's managing these releases, both product and marketing for the minor releases. It means people know who to go to if you've got questions. Developers know who the release lead is for the release that their feature is going in so they can work with them to make sure that that pull request is ready to go. And also, this one has been a bit of a difficult one. So a milestone is something that we use in GitHub to say these are the things that we're thinking we're going to include in this release. So we'll have one for each of the releases. And we've not been very disciplined. We just chuck loads of stuff in there. We don't really think about whether it's going to be ready for that release or not. And that's frustrating for a developer because initially they're told it's going to be in 3.1, then it gets bumped to 3.1.1, then it gets bumped again and bumped again. And it's very frustrating, 
it's also frustrating and demotivating for our release leads when they just have this epic pile to work through and they're never going to actually get to the end. So some of the changes that we're making, and you can have a read of the blog post, which should be up on motic.org now. If you go to mau.tc slash release dust process, you'll find the blog post there. We're going to start having a quarterly release meeting, release planning meeting on the first Tuesday of every quarter, open to all. The product team are also going to choose themes for the bug fixes and for the feature releases. You can read more about that in the article. We're going to have 25 features or bug fixes per release that we choose to go in each release. They need to be ready to be tested and mergeable before we consider them for the release. We're also going to choose five issues that need to be fixed or addressed that we need to find a developer for. So as a marketer, this means that after that meeting, when we've made those milestones, you can actually look and see what should be coming in the next three releases so you've got a sense of when something is likely to be there and as a release team it means we've got a, a target to aim for we have those pull requests which could be merged we just need to find people to test if there are other features or other bug fixes that are not in those 30 it doesn't mean we're not going to consider them for merging it just means that the core team are focused on those 30. And until those 30 emerged, they're not going to be focusing on any other pull requests. So they're not going to be trying to chase you up to get the tests written or anything like that because it's not in their in their sites for that release. So these are the dates for the diary where we're going to have those release meetings. So developers, this is when you need to get your pull requests ready to be merged. And after these dates is when you will know what's going to be coming in the next three months in those releases when we publish. They're all going to be at 2 o'clock UTC. It's on the Mortic community calendar. If you're not on that yet, hop into the product team Slack channel and all the information will be there. We're also looking at funding contributions. So Bounty Source hasn't been used that widely, and we've now introduced it on all the repositories. So if there's a bug that you've got, you can now say, I'm going to put $20 on that. If someone can fix it, I'll pay them $20. If you have multiple people, the developer will get all the money that's associated with that bug if they fix it. And also, it's really great to see that several organizations are also funding their staff to work full time or part time or give some of their time towards the project. So these organizations are already doing that or are just about to start that. If you want to do this as well, awesome. Just let us know and we can put those resources to use. Doesn't have to be coders, could be marketers, could be documentation writers. And finally, we're also looking at investigating opportunities to sponsor individual contributors who we know do really great, valuable things for the community, but they haven't got the capacity to do that as much as we would like because they need to actually earn money. So we're looking at ways that we can fund those individuals through our open collective so it will be transparent. And then this one, this one's quite exciting. So I want to know, how are you using Mortic? Well, we want to know the community. What do we need to do better? What makes Mortic great? And all kinds of other questions. So today, we're going to launch the first annual Mortic user survey. It's online on the mortic.org blog now. You can get the link and go to the survey. You can also use that link to go there as well. It takes about 10 minutes, so it's not massive contribution of time. But the information will really help us to understand more about the community than we can just get from the basic download rates and, and the information we get from the update server. Please do take a look at this. We will also be sending you an email to let you know. But probably once you've got over information overload from this event, we'll probably do that next week, I would think. And on that note, we are actually now using a Mortic instance. Thank you, Acquia, for giving us a campaign studio instance that we can use in the community. So we now have mailing lists. So if you haven't already joined and signed up, please go to mau.tc slash mailing lists, or you'll find it under the community tab on the website. Join the mailing list and we will keep you up to date by telling you information that you want to know about Mortic. So that's all I've got time for today. What questions are there that I can answer? Please pop the questions in the chat. I think David is going to come on and grill me. <laughs> Good
grill you. I don't know. Uh oh. I think you're suspecting something more than it's going to be. Actually, there's been a couple of questions that have been asked. So let me just get into it. Uh, Julio okay. asked, uh, is, is it possible? You know, it's actually, it's interesting because uh, Joey and I started that, uh, the online only uh, Amatic Help Desk, you know, which is not being done in person. And that wasn't set in the rules for how to run a meetup. So Julio mm -hmm. is asking in a similar fashion, is it possible to open up meetups in different cities? uh from the ones uh, where the ones who are in charge are from different places not necessarily right now for him but mm -hmm. is that uh is that okay to open up different meetups in different cities if you're not positioned in that spot i think the main thing is what's in the best interest of the community so if there is a situation where you spend part of your time in this part of the country and part of your time in that part of the country and you can make sure that you can consistently run meetups in those places every month fine um, but from my perspective, what's most important is that there are regular meetings and there's someone who is regularly organizing them and present. And in the normal world, we will hopefully go back to in-person meetups. So I'm kind of, I'm not all that in favor of having someone running a group when they're not located in that area, because you also don't know the local, local information. Um, but I could be convinced. And ultimately it's not my decision that would come to the community team. So the community team would have to review that and decide what they think. But in my experience in Joomla it's worked best if there's boots on the ground. Sure, that makes perfect sense there. I understand that. Uh, Wagner had a question, uh, though it may be too early, but uh, I think a lot of us here are curious, what is, uh, are the initial or tentative plans for next generation? Is it going to be built on a completely different architecture? Is... That's a really good question. So I would say you can have a look at what we've been talking about and the, um, the sit discussions we've been having already because they're historically there in Confluence. So you can read and watch the talks we've had. And Alan also did a talk last year where he talked about some of the thoughts we were having. Some of this is actually already being worked through by some architects at Acquia because they're facing the same problem that Mortic is facing because they're based on the same framework and you know the same software. Um, so the outcome of what they find about how to optimize will trickle down into what might be helpful for us. But predominantly, we're looking at having a front end that is a decoupled application, so probably in Angular. We'll be having some kind of layer in the middle of that that does magic with APIs that communicates with everything um, and potentially have the opportunity to have different data layers underneath. So you can use what ships with Mortic on MySQL. But if you want to, you could use a different database platform. You could have a CDP that manages your contact profiles and segmentation and then pushes everything up into Mortic and does the magic in Mortic to do marketing automation. So there's lots of different options that we're considering. Um, but I would say, yeah, watch back the talk from last year, Alan's talk from last year, and have a look back at the notes in the Composer Initiative. All right, great, great. Uh, you know, actually, even going back to last year, uh, there were some great conversations about diversity. Um, yeah. Uh, how, how is it, uh, over the last year, how has it improved, how has diversity improved within the community? I think actually one of the side effects of having the pandemic is that there's a lot more people able to get involved in a lot more things because they're online rather than in person. I love in-person events, but they can also be really difficult. Um, they can be difficult if you can't travel for whatever reason. They can be difficult if you have a disability. So I have a disability and traveling for me at certain times in my life has been really challenging. Um, so I feel like that has opened things up a bit more. I think we're also, I speak for myself, but hopefully also all of us, much more aware and had our eyes opened over the last year, two years, as to implicit bias and racism particularly. So that's something that has definitely come much more into my awareness over the last 12, 18 months. And I'm much more thinking from the project perspective of, if we're making these decisions, how is that impacting the people who we're trying to engage with? And also trying to think about ways that maybe we are not open and inclusive, ways that we are not welcoming of people and trying to address that. So, yeah. 
good. No, it's an ever going thing. It's yeah, it sure does. You know, it's an ever going, you know, ongoing thing. Um, you know, just yeah. paying attention to it. Just awareness to a large extent makes a big, big difference. And I think Yeah, and I think if you've like if you've ever been excluded from anything in your life, um, if you have the opportunity to build a community where there is or you're trying as hard as you can to not have exclusion, then you'll take it because that's like building your own safe space. And for me, that's why I'm so passionate about it is because I've felt that, you know, I've been on the receiving end, nowhere near as much as some people. Um, but that really drives me to make sure that we are as aware as possible um, and try and make as much, um, trying to be as inclusive as we can as a community and as welcoming as we can as a community. Great. Uh, today is uh, June 17th, 2021, right in the middle of June. Yeah. And we're in, we're in the home stretch for Mautic 4 here. <laughs> Uh, do you have any kind of uh, um, specific time frames that you're really trying to track to? I know that uh, end of June, early July, is there a sense for where uh, you would ideally like to track to and maybe the you know, reality for what may, 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 may come past? It is, it's challenging. And this is one of the ever present challenges of open source is that we are reliant on people's time and time is precious. And a lot of the things that we've been working on, those initiatives I was talking about, are often coming down to one person. Yeah. So my kind of line in the sand is 28th of June, Monday, 28th of June. That's when I would really like to be able to make the Mautic 4 release. Um, but I'm also really aware that that puts a lot of pressure on those people to get all this stuff done. So we do, we really, if we're going to hit that, we have got work we need to do in order to to do that um and hopefully now that this conference is over that frees up my time but it also frees up the time of a few other people we'll be able to really focus our attention and get through those things that need to be done before we can make that release we've also got a whole bunch of stuff to do with marketing as well so we've got some amazing visuals that have been designed by a new contributor which are top secret but they're very cool and i'm very excited that that contributor has decided to join um, but the whole you know, process of communicating out to the world about what's going to be in the release is managed by the marketing team. That has to happen simultaneously with the product and the education team. So, yeah, I'm excited when every contributor decides to join. Uh, yeah, these little, little additions, even little contributions or big contributions. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, yeah. Last question as we wrap up here. I'm curious on what your hopes are for a commercial ecosystem surrounding Mautic? Yeah, I mean, I think, I feel like having a commercial ecosystem around Mautic is really important. In the community council panel earlier, we were talking about um, the Gartner and Forrester and things like that, and the Acquia is in there. And you might think, well, so what? I mean, we're an open source project and Acquia is a company, but the fact that a company based on Mautic is at the top of their game and being recognized for that gives a lot of credibility. So the more organizations that we have that are doing great things with Mautic, the more we actually get people looking into Mautic and using it themselves. But also because those organizations are building businesses around Mautic, it's in their best interest for the Mautic product and the community to grow and thrive. So they are also getting on board with being like, I want to contribute. How do I contribute? And for some of them, it's financial because they haven't got the time to be able to actually contribute. And they may just put like a 1% charge on every invoice and that 1% comes to the community. Or it may be that they just say, we'll contribute $100 a month. It's all welcome. But also you start to see organizations saying, this feature is really missing and my customers are bugging me for it. I'm just going to write it and then we'll contribute it back to the community. And that's where we start to see a real, a real innovation coming is when companies come to us a bit like Deeper that I was talking about saying, there's this problem, we need to solve it for our customers. This is how we're thinking of solving it. If we do it this way, would that work for the community? Those conversations are the conversations I love to have because they're thinking about the community, not assuming that what they want to do is what the community wants, but opening a dialogue about this is how we think we'll do it. Will that be good for the community? So those kind of conversations, I think, as we develop an ecosystem, but also integrations, you know, integrate all the things, 
that is an important part of our ecosystem as well. Having people develop plugins and being able to make a living from supporting Mortic and supporting plugins. Wonderful. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for that presentation and for answering all of our questions there. I, I, I want to say on, on behalf of a number of people, a large number of people uh, and our customers, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything <laughs> that you do in a big, big way. And I say that sincerely. Uh, thank you, you know, very with, much. With, without you, Mautic would be a completely different beast altogether. Um, so, all right. Well, um, I hope everybody joins. There's still some more sessions coming up uh, later on. Yes. So feel free to uh, come on in Absolutely. and um, make sure you join those. And uh, we'll see you next year, if not uh, any sooner. Don't forget. Absolutely. Uh, yep. And uh, thank you again, Ruth. And uh, we'll see you guys soon.